Okay, everyone, this episode of Extra Mythology is going to be a little different. Around our humble animated campfire, we've always said that myths are not stories that are untrue. Rather, they are tales that don't fit neatly into the historical record. You know, stories like In the Mountains Lies Sleeping Kings, or That We Can Toast Marshmallows Only Because This Fire Was Stolen From the Gods, or That Marshmallows Are Actually the Eyes of the Marsh-Dwelling Demon Eric His Gooey Insides Be Praised. You know, all not untrue, except that last one, of course. Because myths serve, indisputably, as the foundations to cultures, and in that is where their truth lies. But what if that changed? What if a myth did fit neatly into the historical record? Is it then still a myth, or a fact, or something else entirely? Well, that's a question I want you to keep in the front of your minds as I tell you today's tale of the giant gold-digging ants of India. Thanks so much to Factor for keeping us well-fed fast. If you've ever been to the Kashmir region, you've probably seen some amazing sights. The glittering doll lake, the Himalayas. But you probably won't remember seeing massive ants hauling up fine gold from the ground. Oh, but they exist! Well, at least according to Herodotus, the so-called father of history. His first-hand chronicle of the ancient world, the Histories, introduced Greek readers of 430 BC to the cultures and customs of South and Western Asia, to their economies, and most importantly, the parts that ants played in them. In India, Herodotus traveled the eastern desert and river marshes, taking notes on the languages, diets, and sexual practices of the population. He wrote of sheep's wool that grew on trees and camels with backwards genitals. So, you know, in that context, giant ants were nothing out of the ordinary. In his telling, these ants, the size of dogs, were truly burrowing machines, and the pile of sand and soil that they displaced would be cut through with gold dust. So much gold, in fact, that if you looked at it while the sun was reflecting off its surface, you would go blind. And the ancient Greeks called these gold-digging creepy crawlies the Myrmex Indicoi, which just means Indian ants. I mean, if there were any other ants in India, the Greeks didn't really want to know about them because they surely weren't pulling their weight like these fellas were. See, to the Greeks, this story made India sound like an absolute paradise. Ants who would dig gold for you? And lots of it! Whoa! And you could just go and take it, right? I mean, what would an ant need with gold? Ah, it's not that simple! Because the Myrmex Indicoi knew the gold had value. The people of Dardistan, west of the Himalayas, found this out the hard way. They figured they could just scoop some of that valuable sand into baggies and skedaddle, which was a big mistake. The ants were on the darts in a second and tore them limb from limb, leaving their remains as a warning to all comers. But if we know anything about humankind, it's that it won't let a couple of ants stand in the way of some easy money. Over time, the dards and other treasure seekers would learn how to outsmart the bug. For instance, the ants dug mostly in winter, preferring, I suppose, to not work much in the summer's brutal heat. So if you stole from them in the summer, there might be less plunder, sure, but also less chance of a giant mandible separating your head from your neck. Oh, I'm sorry, are you finding this historical recounting a little implausible at this point? Okay, okay. Well, you're not alone, because Herodotus's critics certainly did as well. Even in his time, the read on his great work of history was that it was stuffed with blindly reported fables. Heck, he also wrote that cyclopses were real, that Ethiopians communicated like bats, and that a dolphin once saved a famous musician from drowning. So, giant gold-digging ants, huh? Yeah, okay, pal, we'll believe that when we see it. I've seen it. So said Nearchus, an admiral of Alexander the Great, who sailed the Indus River through Kashmir a hundred years after Herodotus's histories. He said he saw the ants himself, and added to Herodotus's account one unsettling detail, that these critters have the furried skin of leopards and shed them like snakes. Still, only two sources, one a supposed fabulist and the other a conquest-thirsty acolyte of Alexander the Great. Make that three! Okay, that was Megosthenes, another Greek historian who went to India in the early 3rd century and wrote a whole book on the place. Miramex Indicoi? He said it checked out. But of course he wasn't entirely reliable either. I mean, 300 years later, the historian Strabo threw some doubt on Megosthenes' description of the Indian subcontinent. For instance, he claimed that it was found by Heracles, which Strabo said was total nonsense. So if Megosthenes believed that, then the stuff about the giant ants? Oh, that that's real, Strabo said. That part I totally buy. Okay, then came uh, Pliny the Elder to confirm that the ants not only existed, but they were bigger than they first reported. Okay, now they were the size of lions with Leon and Courage to match. Short, no spineless insects. These were now gladiators who would go to war for their one true love. Gold! 
And if you think this conviction these ancient historians had that the ants were real ended with the Age of Antiquity, you would be mistaken. In the Middle Ages, questing knights dreamed of slaying such legendary beasts, and peasants fantasized about how their lots in life might be transformed by the treasure. But then, finally, came the Age of Reason. And we all know that it's called that because that was the time that someone finally stood up and said, You know those big ants you keep talking about? Yeah, those are people. You see, over the mountains from Kashmir was Tibet and its gold mines. When Herodotus said that the ants wanted to work in winter, that was probably due to actual human gold miners preferring to work on frozen soil less likely to cave in. Meaning that Nearchus probably did see leopard skins lying about, because that could be what miners were wearing for warmth, not the shed furry skins of giant insects. And when all of these guys wrote in awe of these mighty, again air quotes, ants defending their prize gold from thieves, I mean that seems like a pretty rational human reaction to someone trying to take your stuff because they think you were an ant for some reason. But all this begs the question, how could Herodotus have gotten this so wrong? Could he really not tell the difference between a person and an insect? Honestly, maybe. I mean, in the histories, he did confuse a horse for a hippopotamus, but you know, that's a whole other thing. What's more likely, though, is back in the day, in the Ladakh part of Kashmir, people did casually talk about gold as ant gold, in reference to how ants might sometimes, inadvertently, expose a gold nugget when building their anthills. So maybe Herodotus saw a marmot or something in the distance burrowing furiously in the sand and thought, oh, is that what they're talking about when they mention the ants? Of course, if you lived in Ladakh, this concept of ant gold would have been straightforward. But Herodotus got his wires crossed because he didn't understand the culture he was observing. He didn't know how to correctly interpret it. So, intentionally or not, he confused the story, embellished it, and exported it around the world as fact. And since for his readers, India only existed in the imagination, why couldn't massive ants loaded with gold plausibly walk the earth? And then one day, if you got to visit that faraway land that you've heard fantastical stories about your whole life, I mean, you might just go looking for evidence to support said stories. You turn gold miners in leopard skins into big furry ants until you have a tale that not even Herodotus would recognize. You know, if that is in fact what happened. Because the only other explanation I can think of about how we got here is that Herodotus looked at that marmot I mentioned before and said, I genuinely think that is an ant. Then Nearchus and Augustines went to India, saw the Tibetan gold miners and said, hey, there were those ants he was talking about. And friends, that's not really mythology at all. That's not history. That is just bad eyesight. Ooh, and you know something else I enjoy not overthinking is lunch and dinner. And now thanks to Factor, I never have to. Now, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you know I've talked about meal delivery services like HelloFresh, which I do love because I really do enjoy cooking when I have the time, which is not often these days. So what am I supposed to do, right? I can't just have frozen meals all the time because there's just too many preservatives and they always kind of taste like Garbo. And then my bank account can't really handle more than a few takeout orders a month. So my solution honestly has been Factor, which is this amazing pre-prepared meal delivery service that takes the guesswork out of my breakfast, lunch, and dinner that all of my friends are just very sick of me telling them about. Every meal is ready in around two minutes and there is zero prep, zero mess, just good dang food. Also, Factor really does give you a ton of meal options to choose from and you can basically use it to achieve almost any nutritional goal you may have. They got everything from keto, calorie smart, protein plus, veggie, vegan options, and more, all of which you can choose from in their tastacular rotating weekly menus. I do mine at the start of every week. I get excited about it. Yes, I am that guy. And I am quite glad I stocked up this week because we relaunched Extra Mythology, and that's been keeping me a tad busier than usual. So rather than eating something bad for me or skipping lunch altogether to get work done, instead I'm having fusilli and ground pork tomato ragu, which, hi, I was planning on eating right after I did this read, but just smelled so dang good. I figured I'm going to eat it while I do the read. Here we go. Yeah, mm-hmm. This is what I needed in my life. So if you'd like to eat better while also being better with your time, really all you gotta do is head over to factor75.com slash extra credits 50, and then use the code extra credits 50 to get 50% off your first factor box. And when you do, not only will you be getting fast, tasty meals that fit your lifestyle and be helping out this channel in the process, but you'll also be joining the myriad of my personal friends who I've suggested to jump on this factor train, and they seem to be liking it as well. We are legion now. 
Oh, and don't sleep on their smoothies either. Did I mention they have smoothies? They have pretty dang good smoothies. You can't have this one, it's mine. Again, that is code extra credits 50 to get 50% off your first box at factor75.com slash extra credits 50. Seriously, I've been really enjoying these and I do not think you're going to be disappointed. Say, did you ever hear the one about Skylar Holmes, Kuya Koi, Joseph Blame, Dominic Valenciana, Casey Mustia, Arcolite Games, Angela Valenciana, and Ahmad Ziad Turk being fantastic legendary patrons? Because I sure did.